But with uh, atrial fibrillation, the guidelines suggest our preferred therapy is rate control and lenient rate control. And that's based on a study called the RACE-2 trial. And in a RACE-2 trial, they compared strict rate control where they got the heart rate consistently less than 80 versus lenient race control where the goal was less than 110. And when they looked at it, there was no major difference in response with less than 110 versus less than 80. But it took more visits and more drugs to get less than 80 and did less than 110. So the way it works is they actually try, say, lenient race control is first line for patients with symptomatic AFib. Then they go to strict rate control if they're still symptomatic with lenient. And if they're younger and they don't have a lot of other risk factors, they may try rhythm control and lots of drugs, but the two that are used most often that are complicated to use and not the safest, amiodarone if you have heart failure, and the ophetalide, ticosin, but that requires you to be hospitalized for a couple of days when they start it. Those are the two preferred antiarrhythmics in general. DIG is no longer recommended routinely for atrial fibrillation because it doesn't suppress your heart rate when you exercise, and it's not an antiarrhythmic. So DIG is not as good as beta blockers. So beta blockers are generally first line for rate control. And if you can't take a beta blocker and you don't have heart failure, we could try a rate-limiting calcium channel blocker like verapamil or diltiazem. DILT's the one that's usually used most often. But be careful using it in combination with a beta blocker because they're both negative inotropes and negative chronotropes can put you into complete heart block. And that's not good either. And then the other thing you can do that a lot of people are now doing with the uh, interventional cardiologists they're actually considering ablation where they're going to try and identify the spot where the AFib is coming from and then ablate it. And you may not need lifelong therapy for anything else. But in general, rate control is first. And as an alternative, you can go to ablation. You can also use rhythm, but rhythm is not as quite as effective and much more difficult to do and more toxic than rate control. So that's pretty much where we are. So amiodarone is still used, but it's got a half-life of more than a month, okay? So it, it's got lots of drug-drug interactions that interferes with most of the SIP interactions. And most of these patients with AFib need anticoagulation as well. And in the old days, warfarin had a major interaction with amiodarone because you had to reduce the warfarin dose by about 50% and had to continue to monitor it. Our goal INR is still one to two with warfarin, but now, thank goodness, we have the DOAX or the novel oral anticoagulants, NOAX as some people call them. And the one that's got the best data is actually Eliquis, a Pixaban. And in the Aristotle trial, they compared a Pixaban to warfarin not only did it reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolization greater than warfarin, it also reduced the mortality and it also had significantly less major bleeds than warfarin, where most of the others, the rivaroxaban, the, the bigotrans, the adoxabans, those guys uh, all were either non-inferior to warfarin, and in some cases like the bigotran, at the higher dose actually increased the risk of bleed higher than warfarin did. So the only one that had every outcome in the right direction is a Pixaban. And that's why it's the number one prescribed agent in that category today. And it's twice a day uh, therapy and you only have to reduce the dose if you have two of the three indications for lowering the dose. You have an elevated creatinine greater than 1.5, you're uh, way less than 60 kgs, or you're more than 80 years of age. And you have to have at least two of those to drop from the five milligram twice a day to the two, two and a half milligram twice a day. And that is that is the best of the anticoagulants. Aspirin has kind of been pushed out of the fold. We generally don't use it for AFib anymore. Aspirin's not being used much for 
primary prevention at all anymore for cardiovascular events because the data doesn't suggest it's effective and the risk of bleed is higher than the benefit. So the only people who really are qualifying for aspirin today are people with a history of cardiovascular disease, post-stroke, post-MI, post-bypass, post-stent, those folks. So that's kind of a quick rundown of those kind of things, but uh, lots, lots of things going on. <laughs> Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> yeah, we can put that in there. But I, I didn't. I just gave you the. I, I just gave you the Cliff Notes version, okay, with no slides. <laughs> yes. Yeah, bystolic is a. Uh, beta blocker that is also vasodilator, but it does not have any outcome data in a single study. So it's not in the guidelines as a preferred beta blocker for anybody. And it was the only one that was still branded of uh, the beta blockers. So it was heavily promoted, but it really did not have any good data. And I'm not aware of good information on the problem with Losartan with biostolic. What what are you referring to? Didn't hear you say anything about it. Oh, Losartan, I did talk about that's been used. Right, 150 milligrams. And one thing that's a little different than Los, with Losartan and all the other ARBs, Losartan is the only one that actually lowers your serum uric acid of the uh, ARBs. And what it does, it actually can flush the uric acid through the kidney. So theoretically, at least, it could increase the risk of uh, kidney stones. And those kidney stones, when uric acid is increased, are usually mixed uric acid plus calcium oxalate. So you can get a slight increased risk of kidney stones. And some people thought lowering serum uric acid with Losartan might give a cardiovascular benefit, but we don't have any studies showing that lowering uric acid reduces your risk of cardiovascular events. If we did, then allopurinol should reduce your risk. And the other one that we have, the febuxostat. Febuxostat is like allopurinol to your uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitor, but febuxostat now has a black box warning by the FDA because it looked like in their original trials at the higher dose, while it lowered serum uric acid more than allopurinol did, there was a hint that there might be an increase in cardiovascular events. So as a result of that, the FDA mandated the manufacture of Euloric or Pobuxostat to do a trial comparing it head to head with allopurinol and the primary outcome was cardiovascular events. And that trial was stopped because Pobuxostat increased cardiovascular events more than allopurinol. And when that happened, the FDA changed the label saying that febuxostat should only be used when and if patients cannot take or tolerate allopurinol. So that's now in the, that's a black box warning in the label for febuxostat because it appears to increase cardiac events where we thought lowering uric acid might reduce it. It doesn't. So that's kind of where we are there. Cliff Notes version of that. What else can we answer for you today? One of the reasons I like doing that kind of thing we just did, uh, I get questions from primary care providers all the time. And so uh, I'm used to getting those kind of questions. And I do a, a one hour ask, ask the drug expert at CME meetings for continuing medical education physician primary care providers probably eight or 10 times a year. So I do a, just an open, whatever they want to talk about related to primary care drug therapy, just like we just did there. So that's that's one of the things that, it's my Alzheimer's prevention regimen. Okay, because my grandmother had Alzheimer's disease and I don't want to, I have Parkinson's and that increases my risk of Alzheimer's. My diabetes increases my risk. So, uh, all those things are there and I don't want to do that. So I want to keep my mind and body active. I want to wear out, not rest out. This is the updated standards of medical care 
from the American Diabetes Association. It's updated every year in December and published in a January issue of the journal Diabetes Care as a supplement. So every year there's an update in January that gets published in Diabetes Care. This is a new slide from September of last year when it was published by the American Diabetes Association in association with the EASD, European Association to Study Diabetes. So this is a combination slide from the ADA and the European folks. And there's some new things in here that are really interesting. And uh, I just, this, is, this is worth reviewing real quickly because we've not seen this before. It starts out up here, important 20, this is a 24 hour clock. And these are the things that we need to do that are not related to drug therapy, okay, for patients with diabetes. And it starts off up here with uh, prolonged sitting. How long should we sit before we get up and move around? No more than 30 minutes, sorry. 30 minutes at a time. And one of the things I'm thankful for our College of Pharmacy, we just opened a new building two weeks ago. We moved in in the last month. And our old building was built in 1939. And I had the same offices and same desk, everything. It was, it was really pretty dismal. We now have a brand new building. But one of the things they did in our new building, every one of us got a desk that is can stand or sit. You hit the little button, it goes up and it goes down with your computer on it. So I've got a desk that I can sit with or I can stand with. So that's really a nice addition to have a standing type desk. But every 30 minutes, we should get up and move around. So that's one of the things that's, I'm sorry with these kind of things, but when you, if you want to stand up and move around, please feel free to do so. But that's, that's one of them, okay? And... Stepping, how many steps a day should we try for? Huh? 10,000 is what we were told, but that's probably not correct. We don't need to go to, more is better, but the minimum, according to this, is 500. 500. All right. <laughs> so any, uh, not too many people can't do that. Even I can do that one pretty easily, even when I'm here <laughs> and I'm not walking down through Wall Street. <laughs> You're done already. <laughs> now, a bit more is still better, but 500 is enough to make a difference in outcomes. Now, I'll show you some of that data in just a minute. So that's on here. How about sleep? How much sleep should we get? No more than eight, no less than six. So the sweet spot is between six and eight. Six to eight, no more than eight, no less than six. That's on here. They also have on here the uh, other exercise, sweating for cardiovascular benefit and strength training. So yes, we probably should get about 30 minutes a day five times a week is still the recommendation based on the evidence from the diabetes prevention trial. The diabetes prevention trial showed that that amount of exercise was actually three times more effective than taking metformin at preventing you from developing type two diabetes. That's the most effective thing we can do to prevent or delay. And it actually delayed diabetes an average of 11 years. Metformin delayed it three years. That 150 minutes a week of brisk purpose of walking delayed it 11 years in the Diabetes Prevention Project. Then we want to add to that about 30 minutes of strength training a couple of times a week as well with weight training or those types of things. Then, so that's the physical and then strength training. So that's the exercise over here in addition to the stepping. So this is facilitating positive health behaviors and well-being to improve health outcomes. And this is in, the slide comes from the current standards of care. It was not in last year's standards of care. So this is new. 
okay? So we didn't have the sleep piece. We certainly didn't have the uh, 500 steps in the, in the, old, the old guideline, okay? And I'm going to break some of that down and give you some of that information from the studies where that comes from in the next couple of slides that are not from the ADA. This is also an ADA slide showing what those interventions are. So if you're looking up standing versus sitting, stepping, if you look at sweating, you look at strength training, adequate sleep, good sleep quality, and uh, chronotype consistent timing. All these reduce glucose and insulin. Blood pressure goes down with all but the last one. A1C goes down with all of them. The green is the most. Lipids go in the right direction. Physical function improves. Depression is reduced. Quality of life is increased. That's what they say. This is well being. So, this is kind of, this is again the ADA slide. This is not mine. So, this is from the ADA. I took it out of the uh, standards of care. So here is some data. It's from the Journal of Metabolism in 2014. Whoop, I hit the wrong button here. All right. Adults with type 2 diabetes, interruption of prolonged sitting with activity breaks, such as light intensity walking or simple resistance activities for three minutes every 30 minutes over eight hours decrease postprandial glucose, insulin, C-peptide, and triglyceride levels. That's from diabetes care. And in metabolism, short five-minute breaks every hour over 12 hours and more effectively lowered glucose and insulin. One hour of moderate intensity continuous exercise at the beginning of the day in people with impaired glucose tolerance. So this is some of the references and the data from those references that are in the... Uh, the updated standards of care. Steps and mortality. This is, this is again, this is from British Journal of Sports Medicine, July of 2021. And there's some other references up here. So if we look at five, increase 500 steps a day is number one, two to 9% decrease in cardiovascular mortality, morbidity and all cause mortality just by 500, increase your steps by 500 a day, two to 9%. A one milligram average acceleration, 5% all-cause mortality, five to six minutes of brisk walking, 500 steps in five minutes, a four-year greater life expectancy. Four-year greater life expectancy. So these are all the references and what the data came from the ADA. So converging evidence, preliminary estimation, the inactive people, an increase in difference of 500 steps per day, associated with a two to 9% decrease risk of cardiovascular morbidity, or cause mortality. A five to six minute brisk walk associated with greater life expectancy of 3.9 years. So there's some things we can do that almost everybody can do very easily. So start with this and then build upon it. That's what the goal is, to start here and then go up from here. Sleep in A1C. The quantity of sleep is known to be associated with a U-shape in health outcomes. Obesity in A1C, with both long greater than eight hours and short less than six durations having negative impacts. By extending the sleep duration of short sleepers, it's possible to improve insulin sensitivity and reduce energy intake from sleep medicine. Total sleep duration is significantly associated with A1C in a U-shaped manner. Worse glycemic control with both short and long sleep. So median nadir is seven hours and 16 minutes. Sleep efficiency, higher A1C in individuals with lower sleep efficiency, higher variability, and worse quality of sleep. And that's from Diabetes Care. That was first published in 2020 in Diabetes Care. Oop, boom, back up one more. Exercise in A1C, interventions with combined aerobic and resistance training, superior to either mode alone, a greater reduction in A1C has been noted in adults with type 2 diabetes if they had combined program with aerobic activity as well as strength training. 
So the combination, and that's what the goals are. So 150 minutes a week of brisk purposeful walking is what was used in the diabetes prevention program, and 30 minutes twice a week of strength training on top of that is even better. So the combination combined training significantly improved A1C levels over non-exercising controls, although neither resistance nor aerobic training alone resulted in significant changes. So the combination is what's recommended. And that's one of the reasons I do rock steady boxing from my Parkinson's disease three days a week for an hour. Because I'm getting aerobic activity, I'm getting strength training. We do weight training, we do balance training, and we hit the bags and we do all types of uh, different things. We ride the bike, uh, the rowing machine, and you name it. So that is the lifestyle piece from the new guidelines. And this is emphasized more this time than it has ever been in the past. So how many of you had heard that before? As I said, this was not published initially until October of last year was the first time that first slide I showed you came up. And this year's standards of care is the first time it was in it. So this is, this is new data in the last year. So always something new to talk about. This is the current use of glucose-lowering medications and the management of type 2 diabetes. It's meant to be added to, not in lieu of, lifestyle changes. That's important. These drugs are not meant to replace lifestyle changes. And that's what our patients think we're doing when we give them medication. And that's not realistic. So they've really put in, they used to say, besides lifestyle, everybody should be put on metformin. Now they've given us options to use other drugs other than metformin, depending on the patient. So metformin does not have to be, it can still be, but it doesn't have to be your first line drug. Okay, that's another major change in these guidelines. But what they started, if you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, ASCVD, somebody who has had a history of a stroke, a heart attack, bypass surgery, a stent, peripheral vascular disease, any atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the body, then they want you to use a drug that has been shown to reduce their risk of having a cardiovascular event. And the drugs that are best demonstrated in that, we have basically a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT-2 with proven cardiovascular benefits. So they both say with proven cardiovascular benefit. Not all the SGLT2s have proven cardiovascular benefit. Not all the GLP1s have proven cardiovascular benefit. So they want you to use ones that have proven benefit, and we'll show you those. Okay? Then they go down. If A1C is still above, for patients on a GLP1, consider adding an SGLT2 with proven benefit or vice versa. So once you start, if you start with your GLP-1 analog, like liraglutide dictosa or dulaglutide trulicity or semaglutide ozempic, which are the best three with outcome data, and you're not at goal, then we want you to add one of the three evidence-based SGLT2s, and only two of those are really in spades with evidence on outcomes. So again, infoglosin or dapfoglosin have the best cardiovascular outcome data. So those, the only downside to that is cost for both of them. You're looking at over $1,000 a month for those two drugs, where metformin is pennies a day. Okay, so there's lots of, there's lots of downside and depends also where I would start would depend on how much A1C reduction they need because GLP-1s give us lots of A1C reduction, one to one and a half percentage point reduction in A1C. SGLT2s, the average reduction is only 0.5 to 0.7 of 1% in people who have elevated uh, A1Cs and they have normal renal function. So that's with ASCVD. And then they also say you could add a TZD. I'm not a big fan of adding a TZD. I'd, Again, I'd have metformin on there before I got to a TZD, but 
PZDs can actually cause heart failure, can cause other side effects. They cause weight gain. They cause peripheral edema. They're not as well tolerated, but they're inexpensive now because they're generic. If we look at this red one, these are patients who actually have heart failure. And we talked a little about this yesterday. If they have heart failure, the first line drug is an SGLT2 because we have great data showing that SGLT2s treat all types of heart failure, reduce morbidity and mortality, at least DAPA reduces cardiovascular mortality in addition to heart failure hospitalizations. And EMPA also reduces the composite heart failure and hospitalization, but is driven by heart failure hospitalizations. So those are the only two evidence-based SGLT2s for heart failure. And if you need to add something to that, it's safe to add a GLP-1 in patients with heart failure. It's also probably safe to add metformin with heart failure as long as their uh, renal function is okay, their EGFR is greater than 30. And then if they have CKD, we prefer again an SGLT2 because they've been shown to slow the rate of progression, end-stage renal disease, in addition to our ACE or ARB that they need to be on, in addition to blood pressure control, and we now may also add phenarinone, as I'll show you a little bit later, carendia to those patients based on if they have diabetes. So all these are things we'd look at. You can also add a GLP-1. They are fine with impaired renal function, but they don't have data that they prevent progression like SGLT2s do or aldosterone antagonists do. And then you come over here, and for glycemic management and provide efficacy to achieve goals, and you're looking at weight. They want us to consider weight, so they put weight in this table, and they come down here and say, very high efficacy, dulaglutide, trulicity, high dose, semaglutide, and terazepatide, manjuro. So they list those three drugs for people who are overweight and need to help lose weight. They don't put the other GLP ones in there. So semaglutide has the Wagovi, the higher dose for weight loss. Dulaglutide is not approved for weight loss, but we do have the higher doses now, and I'll show you that, that has even more weight loss with a higher dose than the low dose. And pending FDA approval for weight loss is terazepatide Monjuro later this year, but it also has the greatest weight loss in addition to A1C reduction. So it's already on here for diabetes. So those are the three that have the highest, very high. Then high, they give you a combination of oral and continuous injectable GLP-1, and then also high GLP-1 that is not the ones you talk about there, metformin, SGLT2, sulfonylureas, PZDs, and then intermediate DPT, DPP4 uh, inhibitors, which are pretty much neutral on weight. Insulin increases weight, TZDs increase weight. So pretty much the only ones that really lower the weight significantly are the GLP1s. And it's just three of the GLP1s or the twin cretins, we call it, terazepatide, monjuro. We'll talk about all those drugs and all their data. And then with the weight management again, and for weight loss, again, you can see them on here. So this is the new treatment algorithm from the ADA as of January, 2023. Again, these are the ADA slides. Pharmacologic therapy, healthy lifestyle is first. In adults with type 2 diabetes and established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, treatment measures should include agents that reduce cardiorenal risk. And those are GLP-1s and SGLT2s. So they're really pushing us to move in that direction. Pharmacologic approach provides adequate efficacy to achieve and maintain treatment goals should be considered, such as metformin or other agents, including combination therapy, 
And where do we want our A1C? For most people, less than seven. And we'll show you some of the data for that. Weight management's important. So glucose lowering treatments should consider approaches that support weight management goals. Level evidence A. Metformin should be continued upon initiation of insulin unless contraindicated or not tolerated for ongoing glycemic and metabolic benefits, level evidence A. So a trial that was done years ago called the HOME trial. HOME trial took patients with type 2 diabetes who were being treated with insulin and either titrated the insulin up to get the A1C to go or added metformin to the insulin therapy and continued to follow them over time. And what they found is they could lower the insulin dose an average of 19 to 20% by adding metformin over baseline. They got slightly lower A1C adding metformin and titrating insulin up. But more importantly, they got a 34% greater drop in cardiovascular morbidity and mortality adding metformin to insulin than using insulin alone. So this is the only trial we have with combination insulin plus metformin but when you go to insulin as your last line drug, you don't stop the metformin unless there was another reason to stop it. And it's usually because their EGFR is less than 30 and they might be at risk of lactic acidosis, which is very rare with metformin. It was common with the old drug. Anybody remember the old drug? DBI or fenformin. Fenformin or DBI by US Vitamin was the one that was the first drug in that category was replaced by metformin because it was much safer and fenformin has gone by the wayside. So metformin replaced it, but that was the one that caused the cases of lactic acidosis and bad outcomes. This is something that most people don't do that probably should do. Early introduction of insulin should be considered if there is evidence of ongoing catabolism, weight loss. So when I was first diagnosed with uh, type two diabetes, I was actually on a cruise for university learning systems. <laughs> when Don and Carol, <laughs> okay, not Charlene's, I can't blame this one on Charlene. <laughs> but I ignored the symptoms. I, I knew where every bathroom on that ship was. And I was, I actually lost about 25 pounds without trying to lose weight because I kept peeing out my glucose and it was elevated. And when I was diagnosed, my A1C was 13. <laughs> when I finally had it checked, it was 13. And I had lost about 25 pounds. So I would have fallen into this category. And what that means is you've got really high blood sugars and your beta cell function is not functioning at all. As glucoses go up about 250 or 300, that glucotoxicity is toxic to your beta cells in the pancreas. It, it turns off their ability to secrete insulin. So you have to get the blood sugar down to below 250 before your beta cells can get back in gear and start to produce insulin again. So that's glucose toxicity. So the guidelines recommend you may need to start somebody who's in this category who has an elevated A1C, typically above 10 in particular, but even those above eight or nine may benefit from starting on insulin. And once you get them down, then you can, the other therapies kick in and will work better. And you can, you can, take, you can take the insulin off. Okay, so this is just short term to treat the glucotoxicity because the other drugs don't treat glucotoxicity, insulin does. So that's the rationale why they say early introduction of insulin should be considered if there's ongoing catabolism, weight loss, if symptoms of hyperglycemia are present, A1C is greater than 10, or glucose is 300 are very high. And that's expert opinion, but that's what they've said. And they've said that for quite a while. And the American College of Endocrinology ACE guidelines say the same thing, except they lower this to eight. You don't have to have it as high as 10. That's, they say greater than 10 here. Adults with type two diabetes have 
GLP-1 receptor is preferred to insulin when possible. So before you add, consider adding insulin long-term for somebody who has lost control or that you want to start therapy, you've already corrected the glucose toxicity, they suggest that GLP-1 is preferred over insulin because, again, if you choose one that has outcome data, it's been shown to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So they would prefer that over insulin if you can. If insulin is used, a combination with a GLP-1 receptor is recommended for greater efficiency, durability of treatment, weight, and hypoglycemic benefit, level evidence A. So there's not a concern adding a GLP-1 to insulin or insulin to a GLP-1, especially if you're just using a once a day or long acting basal insulin. There's no reason because the basal insulin is not gonna cover your meal glucose where your GLP-1 only increases endogenous insulin when you eat. If you don't eat, it doesn't increase your insulin. So that's why you don't get much hypoglycemia with one of the GLP-1 analogs. They only increase insulin response to a meal. Okay, and if you don't eat, they don't increase insulin. Where sulfonylureas increase insulin whether you eat or not. And that's why they have a much higher rate of hypoglycemia. These are the tables for the various medications, metformin, SGLT2s, GLP-1s, and the combination GLP-1, GIP, Monjuro, terazepatide. And it goes across with side effects, mechanisms, all that kind of stuff. So you, you, can, you have this slide you can get from uh, uh, Charlene on the two pages, but this is actually not gonna be readable from here, okay? This is a, a slide from the slide deck from the ADA. This is not my slide, this is the ADA slide. And it's really difficult to read. But if you get efficacy, metformin is high, SGLT2s are intermediate to high, and I don't really believe they're high. GLP1s are high to very high, and terazepatide monjuro is very high. So they actually, this is the greatest other than insulin, the greatest reduction, Monjuro, then the GLP-1s, especially the higher doses of semaglutide and the higher doses of dulaglutide. You've got to push the dose to get the greatest A1C reduction. Then they have the weight changes and the greatest very high loss with Monjuro, loss or intermediate to very high with GLP-1s, SGLT-2s, less... Uh, beneficial, but they're in the right direction, but they're not going to give you significant weight loss. Then it goes to uh, GI effects, and then it goes to uh, what does it say? Uh, the renal effects, which we've already talked about. Then we have the cost, and we have some other clinical considerations of all the major classes that are recommended in the updated guidelines. And this is the glycemia standards of, and looking at other characteristics. And here is the so with insulin, typically you're going to be on either metformin, SGLT2, and or GLP. You start low and go slow. To a GLP-1, you're less likely to see the weight gain that you see. Okay. And since you're on a GLP-1, you're less likely to have to add a like a short-acting fast onset insulin with meals because your GLP-1 you eat. So you're only adding a basal insulin to turn off hepatic glucose production and to cover your uh, fasting glucose is where you're going to get with your basal insulins. And the basal insulins that are recommended usually the once a day is for most people. So insulin glargine, and now we have two FDA approved biosimilars that are interchangeable. 
Lily and myelin both have interchangeable insulin glargine lances. And lances or glargine, that branded one, is the number one selling insulin in the world. So we now have two biologics that are both interchangeable. And the prices are significantly less. We'll come back and show you that in a little bit. GLP-1 cardiovascular outcome trials. The Elixir trial with lexinotide. Anybody dispense lexinotide? I haven't seen it used ever. By Sanofi. And it does not have great outcome data. So none of these outcomes were statistically significant. Did not reduce cardiovascular events in the Elixir trial. So it's not recommended in the guidelines. Liraglutide. The leader trial is significant. The three-point MACE, MACE, major adverse cardiac event is what that stands for. And typically a three-point MACE is cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. Those are the three pieces that make a three-point MACE usually. And that's a composite endpoint you'll see in a lot of clinical trials cardiovascular-wise. It's statistically significant. We also see a reduction in cardiovascular death that's significant. MI is not quite because it does include one, but it's right at the, the level. We also see stroke is not significant. It's got both sides of one. All-cause mortality is reduced, and worsening nephropathy is also reduced. So it's an evidence-based drug. So this is liraglutide dictosa has outcome data. Sustain-6 is a cardiovascular outcome trial with injectable semaglutide. So this is Ozempic, not the Wagovi dose, the uh, Ozempic. And its three-point MACE is also significant, as is cardiovascular death is not there. MI is not there. Stroke is there. All-cause mortality is not there. And nephropathy is there. So it did reduce the three-point MACE, but did not reduce cardiovascular death in the sustained six trial. But sustained six is a much smaller study than the other. See, it's only 3,200 people versus 6,000, 9,000. So it's a much smaller study. And median follow-up is only 2.1 years. So if they had had larger numbers, those would have been statistically significant differences. But they do consider it as a cardiovascular evidence-based drug. So Ozempic sustained six trials, the only outcome trial we have with it. And then we come over to XSL with extanatide and it release. And only thing that meets statistical significance is all-cause mortality, but the three-point MACE is not quite statistically significant. So do we use much of it? By Durian, we don't see it used much anymore either. So it's not in the guideline as the recommended one. And then you have the uh, rewind trial with dulaglutide, and it is significant for the three-point mace. It's also significant back here for stroke, but it's not significant for mortality. It is significant for worsening nephropathy. But the major difference with the rewind trial, while it's a large number, it's the only trial that included patients who didn't have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. It's got a large number of primary prevention folks in it, where all the others are secondary prevention trials. So these guys had people who already had a history of coronary disease. So which one's gonna be easier to show a difference in cardiovascular mortality? Primary or secondary prevention? Secondary prevention. So rewind, trulicity is in the guidelines as beneficial. It does meet the uh, primary outcome, but it didn't reduce cardiovascular mortality, but it's got a large number of primary prevention patients. So it's gonna take longer to show a benefit in primary prevention than it is for secondary prevention. Does that make sense? So that's, that's some of the nuances with these outcome trials. And again, this slide is not mine. This is right from the ADA slide deck. This is the data from the AWARD-11 trial with higher dose dulaglutide trulicity. And basically, they compared the 
old maximum dose, which was one and a half milligrams when it was first approved. That was the target dose. Then they came out with a three milligram and a four and a half milligram dose. So we have a 0.75, a 1.5, a three, and a four and a half. We now have four doses of trulicity. So what they did, they compared the two new doses to the original 1.5 dose and followed them basically 52 weeks. So here is the three doses. Here's the A1C reduction, minus 1.5, 1.7, 1.9. So you got a little bit more A1C reduction dose goes up and weight loss went up you have minus 6.8 pounds, minus 8.8, .8, minus 10.4 pounds. So as you go up on the dose, you get lower A1C and you get more weight loss. And we don't have outcome data with the three milligram or four and a half milligram. The outcome trial rewind, the target dose was 1.5 once a day or once a week, if it's a weekly. Okay. So the FDA has now approved these. So you have all four doses now of Trulicity. And the nice thing is, it's the nicest delivery system. If you don't, if you have a needle phobia, you don't see the needle because the needle is already attached to it. And you pull the cap off the bottom, you unlock the lever and push the, uh, put it on where you're going to inject it, push the button and you hear the first click and that's it starting to go down. You wait for the second click, and that's the needle retracting, going back into the, the pen, then you throw it away. That's how it works. And it's the, it's the nicest delivery system. They don't, have to, they don't have to inject the insulin. All they got to do is push the button to get it started. So it is an auto injector. And no needle on the front end or the back end. You don't see or have to touch a needle. We also have the same thing with the newer doses of semaglutide. They also have higher doses. Uh, and this again is not the Wagovi highest dose that's for weight loss. This is just for type two diabetes. And basically is now approved at 0.51 and two milligram doses. And the two milligram dose is here. So here's the once weekly two milligram A1C reduction, 2.2%. Body weight reduction, 6.9 kgs, one milligram, 1.9% 1 versus six kgs. And the treatment policy estimate that basically this is the trial and that's the reduction in A1C and weight loss. Statistically significant when it comes to both of these are greater than the one milligram dose. So we now have another dose we can add to the uh, semaglutide if you can get it. There's still a, a shortage in a lot of places. Here's the new kid on the block that we're waiting for FDA approval for weight loss, but this is the diabetes data. May of last year, it was approved just about a year ago. First in class, and it's both a GLP-1 agonist and a GIP. Glucose, uh, both affecting the GI tract, okay? So the GIP and GLP combination, we call it a twin cretin. Twin cretin is what it's called. It's sub-Q injection with a similar delivery device as uh, dulaglutide, trulicity. Different doses. You've got a 5, a 10, a 15. We're evaluated in five clinical trials. And it was also compared to semaglutide, Ozempic. So it enhances first and second phase insulin secretion, reduces glucagon levels in both glucose-dependent manner. So if your glucose is not elevated, it doesn't do anything, just like your GLP-1s. So it's got the GLP-1 in addition to GIP effect reduces both fasting and postprandial glucose concentration. The reason it reduces the fasting is because it suppresses hepatic glucose production. So that's more effective with this drug to do that than the traditional GLP-1 analogs. That additional GIP effect affects hepatic glucose production. So it lowers both fasting and postprandial. 
So if you look at the 15 milligram target dose, 28% uh, reduction in fasting uh, glucagon concentration and A1C is reduced by 43% of glucagon compared with no change for placebo. Delays gastric emptying, which all the GLP-1s do, is largest after the first dose and the effect diminishes over time. It slows post-meal glucose absorption, reducing postprandial glucose. All the GLP-1s do that. Elimination half-life is about five days. It's dosed once a week. Sub-Q auto-injector once a week. So here is the uh, results of the SURPASS-2 trial. And this has got semaglutide as a comparator. And remember, semaglutide used to be the target dose was one. This is before we had the data with the two milligram newer, higher dose. So what we have here is A1C baselines are all 8.3. Change at week 40, minus 1.9 A1C with semaglutide. Monjuro 5 is minus 2, 2.2 at the 10, and 2.3 at the 15 milligram dose. If we look at difference, so it's about 0.2 to 0.4 or 5 greater, and then uh, semaglutide. Patients achieving A1C is less than seven. You're looking at 80 to almost 90%. Fasting glucose, you see what those are. Change at week 40, minus 49 with semaglutide, and in the 50s and above with uh, Monjuro. Body weight baseline, you can see, is in the uh, low 90s. Change at week 40, 5.7 kgs with semaglutide, you'll get eight, nine, and 11 kgs with monjuro terazepatide. So terazepatide has more weight loss associated with, and this is not the weight loss study. This is the patients with type two diabetes used for diabetes. The difference you can see in the kilograms is about two to five and a half kgs greater weight loss in one year with Terazepatide than with semaglutide ozempic. So here's how it comes, all these different doses, and it takes basically your autumn, basically on each dose for a month. So it, it's going to take you to get to the highest dose several months because you have to tolerate the lower dose before you move to the higher dose just like you do with the GLP-1 analogs. But this is a relatively slow titration with this drug. And this drug causes more nausea and vomiting than most of the GLP-1s. The other thing it's gonna cause, and we'll show you this data in a minute, is more hair loss. And that's true for the whole class of drugs. But it's not related to the drugs. It's not drug-related. We'll come back to that. This price is about a thousand bucks. Okay, for a month's supply, and it's four, that's four pens. Because each one is one. So it's actually you actually need uh, 13 prescriptions a year. So that's why it comes out to a yearly cost of over twelve thousand six hundred dollars. Okay, because and that's the same for all the these guys, none of these guys are cheap has to be stored in the refrigerator until you get ready to use it, but can stay out for up to 21 days at room temperature. And again, the delivery system is the same as Trulicity. So I'm out one trial. This is the first trial that was published and done for obesity. This has now been submitted to the FDA for priority approval. We should see this approved sometime this summer is what we anticipate FDA approval of Monjuro or terazepatide for obesity, for weight loss. The phase three double-blind trial, adults with a BMI of 30 or more with no risk factors, 27 or more with at least one risk factor, excluding diabetes. So this data is not in patients with diabetes, okay? You saw the data in patient diabetes in the last trial, surpassed two. 
and 5, 10, or 15 milligrams for placebo for 72 weeks, including a 20-week dose escalation period. It takes 20 weeks to get to the target highest dose. So it doesn't happen rapidly. Co-primary endpoints, change in weight from baseline and a weight reduction of 5% or more. Here's the percent change in body weight. The five milligram dose, 15%. 10 milligram, 19.5%, 15 milligram, 20.9%, placebo, 3%. First drug we've ever had to show a reduction in weight in one year, basically, because it was 72 weeks, but 20 weeks was titration. So it's only one year, 52 weeks of active therapy at target doses to get a 20% average reduction in weight loss with the drug. No other drug for weight loss has ever come close to that. And that's why this one is in high demand off label for weight loss, whether you had diabetes or not. And here is the curves with the weight loss. While they're starting to plateau a little bit, they haven't totally flattened out. So at the end of a year of active therapy at the target dose, it's still trending down. It hasn't plateaued and it hasn't started to come back up again. The problem is when you stop the drug, guess what happened? It does go back up again. That's true for every one of the drugs we have for weight loss. And why the new paradigm is going to be, this is a chronic disease like hypertension. So you are probably going to have to treat it long term. It is not going to be a short term fix. So the new paradigm that we're embracing for weight loss is it's a chronic illness, just like any other chronic disease, like high blood pressure or lipid disorder, and we're gonna to need to treat long-term. It's not gonna be a short-term fix. Hair loss with weight loss medications. My daughter, uh, had prediabetes and she was on Monjuro on a study and for weight loss, she lost a lot of weight quickly and she couldn't get to the highest dose because they couldn't get the drug for her. So she only got on the five milligram dose and lost uh, 30 pounds at the five milligram dose. But she also said, my hair was coming out. I brush my hair and I get big clumps. I get lots more hair than I normally lose. And that is common with any weight loss program, including weight loss surgery. Same thing happens. Why do you think it happens? The hair cells are one of your rapid turnover cells in the body, just like your GI tract and your bone marrow, the three rapid turnover cells, most rapid turnover. And when you lose weight rapidly, what has happened to your nutritional intake usually? You've decreased your nutritional intake and the body shunts your nutrition away from those cells and you lose the hair. So the hair follicles are not stimulated to produce hair. The good news is once you stop about three months after you complete the therapy or stop the therapy, it plateaus and then it grows back in. So it's not a long-term problem. It's a short-term problem that happens with every weight loss method we have, and there may be some things we can do to prevent it. And the number one thing is to make sure you don't diminish your protein intake significantly when you're on these drugs or trying to lose weight. It's the protein piece, it's the most important, but also maybe some other things, biotin, iron, protein, and zinc have all been related, but most important is maintain an adequate protein intake when you're on these drugs, and that will minimize some of the hair loss, but that's been a common complaint, especially in the, in the uh, literature you see on the internet with people who are using the drug and complaining about significant hair loss with Ozempic, with Wigovi, with Manjuro. The other side effect you'll see is significant GI distress. And the way to reduce that is to eat smaller, more frequent meals. Because if you eat larger meal, these guys reduce gut motility. 
So the stomach stays full longer in addition to affecting the satiety center in the brain. And you're gonna feel like you're more bloated and you're gonna get more nausea and vomiting from that. So reduce the amount of food you take per meal and increase the frequency instead of the uh, amount that you eat at one meal. So that will help with the GI distress for most of these drugs. And that's another common complaint. Uh, and the weight loss is not due to the GI distress. This is data with adolescents with uh, semaglutide, the STEP teens trial, and a 68 week trial in those 12 to 18 years of age. And here are the effects percent change in BMI. And these are obese teens. Again, significant reduction. The BMI is going down. Uh, here about 15, so a significant reduction, and it does plateau. And then you stop it and see what happens. It goes back up again. And you can see the weight loss over here versus placebo at the uh, percent change in the weight thresholds at week 68. So this is a uh, teenage study published in New England Journal late last year for weight loss. The shortage. Uh, basically, the Wagovi folks, uh, Nova Nordisk, have asked us not to start new people on Wagovi for weight loss because they can't keep up with the demand for the drug, the higher dose semaglutide. And they are building additional, they're building a new plant in North Carolina to produce it, just like Lily is building two new plants to produce uh, Terazepti Monjuro. So the companies are really gearing up to meet the demand because they think these things are gonna take off based on the new paradigm that this is gonna be a chronic disease we need to treat long-term. And we don't have outcome data yet from a cardiovascular standpoint, but those studies are still underway. So this is going to be potentially a game changer. These guys are really effective at helping people lose weight. And keeping it off as long as you continue to take the drug. Here are the SGLT2 cardiovascular outcome trials. And AMPAREG outcome I showed you yesterday, the three point MACE is significant. The CANVAS program, three point MACE is also the significant with canagliflozin. We just don't have the heart failure and data. We have renal data and cardiovascular data. And we have the DAPA data as well. I showed you that trial yesterday. So we've got good outcome data for all three of these guys, but the best outcome data is either EMPA for primary prevention and DAPA for heart failure. This is data in children with DAPA because none of these are approved for kids yet. This is a phase three trial. And Kenna and EMPA are both undergoing phase three studies in kids and adolescents. And this is the data with the fourth one of these guys, ertagliflozin, the Latro, the Virtus trial. Problem is it doesn't reduce events to the same degree. So when you look at uh, ertagliflozin, major adverse cardiovascular events are identical, 11.9%. Death from cardiovascular, is in the right direction, but it doesn't reach statistical significance. So ertagliflozin does not have good outcome. It's not recommended by the guidelines. Less expensive, but it doesn't have the evidence to support it. And this is the primary outcome or MACE. See the lines are almost identical. So again, not what we see with EMPA, not what we see with DAPA or TANA. FDA approved indications for the three and the fourth ERTA is only to lower glucose, not for any other outcomes. Newest kid on the block. We have a fifth one. It was just approved. It's in the process of being launched. Vexagliflozin, Brenzavi by uh, Theracos Bio, approved January of this year. And again, it's an SGLT2, 
Recommended dose 20 once a day taken in the morning with or without food. Not recommended EGFR is less than 30. Cost, I don't know, I haven't seen the cost yet. Clinical trial data, root A1C reduction 0.4. None of these guys are really great at lowering A1C. And had similar effects on A1C, only difference of 8% in fasting glucose, 4 kg weight loss was in favor of BEXA. This is their versus citagliptin. Citagliptin reduced A1C 0.1% more than BEXA and fasting blood sugar by five milligrams less. Between 30 and 60 mils, moderate renal impairment, you also see reduced A1C by 0.3. So less as renal function declines. This is their major adverse cardiac event trial, MACE trial, composite, your uh, MACE. And if you look at the outcomes at the end of the trial, minimum duration, 52 weeks, 10.1% in the placebo, 7.9% in the BEXTA group, and was not superior to placebo in reducing MACE. It didn't reach statistical significance. It's in the right direction, but didn't reach statistical significance for the composite. So again, I'm not going to put that high in my list of the evidence-based SGLT2s at this point in time. Warnings and precautions are the same for all the drugs in this category, SGLT2s. Ketoacidosis, if it occurs, it's like to occur in somebody who's stressed or having surgery. They have type 2 diabetes and they have euglycemia. Their blood sugar is not high like we normally see with people with type 1 diabetes before they get ketoacidosis. So they can have what we call euglycemic ketoacidosis. Lower limb amputations may or may not be related to these drugs, but somebody with a history of Diabetic foot ulcers, history of lower limb amputations, I'd be a little bit cautious using any of the drugs in this category. And it could be related to what? What do they do to blood volume? And initially, they lower blood volume, so they might reduce perfusion for people who already have poor peripheral circulation, and that may be the issue. So that could be the association. We don't really know. Volume depletion, so you got to teach them how to get up out of a chair, how to get out of bed in the middle of the night, keep up with their fluid. Urosepsis and polynephritis can occur because you're flushing glucose through the urine 24 hours a day in these patients. Hypoglycemia is low because remember, where's the new set point for spilling glucose in the urine? Normally, it's less than 200 or 180. 70 to 90. So you're not likely to go below 70, right? Because you're, you're still going to reabsorb glucose at that point, okay? Necrotizing fasciitis of the perineum, Fournier's gangrene. Gangrene of the genital area, especially with poor hygiene, okay? And people have died from this. People have had to have multiple surgical interventions from this, okay? And... General mycotic infections, canadiasis is very common in both men and women with this drug because you're going to pee out glucose and it's going to go out and you're going to set up the environment. It's going to be right for Canada to grow. Okay. So those are the major downsides. Lower limb amputations, they did see a couple of cases in the back savvy data just like they did with canagliflozin. They haven't seen it with EMPA. They haven't seen it much with DAPA, but the data is still there that it is a possibility. So that's the SGLT2s. Questions on those guys? Five to choose from now. Two have great evidence across the board. One has some evidence. The other two really don't have any evidence. This was the FDA approval of Semgly initially, which was the first biosimilar to insulin glargine that was actually approved as interchangeable. We'd already had 
Lily had Basiglar, which was a biosimilar, but was not interchangeable. It was approved under a different pathway. So we had insulin glargine lancis, we had Basiglar, and now we have Semgli, which is the first interchangeable one. So they submitted data to show if you switch somebody from Lancis to Semgli or back and forth, there's no difference at all. So they got the first one. And when you get it, you have one year of exclusivity if you do the studies to get interchangeability with the biosimilars. First interchangeable. And here's the costs of these guys. So Lancis Solastar, five pens, $425. And these are all going to come down significantly when it comes out of pocket because the company has been pressured to reduce the cost to no more than $35 out of pocket per month for their insulin. Assembly, you can see, is 147 list price for a box of five pens. 65% less expensive than Lancis for the pens, AWP. The vial is also significantly less. Basiglar was between the two. And again, it is not an interchangeable, but it is made by Lilly that also now has Resvoglar that was also just recently approved as an interchangeable bio, uh, biosimilar to Lancis as well. And it cost $92 list price for a box of five pens. So that there's a lot of competition out there. We now have three interchangeable. We can substitute at the point of sale in the pharmacy because they're considered interchangeable. So they're FDA approved to be interchangeable. So if somebody writes for Lantish, you could give them Semgly, you could give them Resvoglar, as long as your state allows you to substitute interchangeable biosimilars, and there's no reason they wouldn't let you do it. Some states require the patient to sign off on it, others do not, as long as the physician writes substitution permitted. If they're right for Lantus, you can give them assembly, you can give them resvoglar. The problem is that some of the third-party payers, the PBMs, are still preferring Lantus over assembly over resvoglar, and in my case, I was told Initially, I had to stay on Lancis. Back in January of this year, I was told I had to switch to Semgly. But my out-of-pocket cost is still $60 for a month's supply, no matter if I get Lancis or Assembly, because they're not passing the savings on to the patient. The co-pays the same, right? It's each, they want to make the difference. And the reason they wanted me to stay on Lancis initially is the rebates were over 65%. And again, they're not passed on to the patient. Patient doesn't get to benefit from the rebate. I still have the higher copay, the brand copay, and it doesn't matter which one I get. Cost me the same out of pocket until we see the intervention of the $35 a month maximum cost, then my copay will go to 35, no matter which one I get. So all those are things that are in the process right now, but it's a it's a mess out there in the uh, for the patients. But yes, this one is the least cost list price. These are list prices here. And it was originally approved December of 2021 when they got it approved, but it wasn't until November of 22 that they gave it the interchangeable because Semgly's interchangeability exclusion period didn't run out until then. So that's why they didn't market it until that period had, ex had expired. Because the FDA would not allow you to market another interchangeable biosimilar until that time has expired. Even though they approved it, they wouldn't let you market it yet. So you can see, you'll expect to see that with all the interchangeable biosimilars that are getting ready to explode in this market. Humira, Humira and a whole bunch of things are coming with interchangeable biosimilars. And the first one's going to have at least one year exclusivity. It's not six months like it is for prescription drugs. It's a year for interchangeable biosimilars. April of this year, the House of Representatives approved the $35 monthly limit on out-of-pocket spending on insulin over the second time in the 117th Congress. But that's the house. 
what hadn't happened. The Senate. And I shouldn't say this, but the Senate's in the pocket of farm. The number one, the number one contributor to PACs and political campaigns is pharma. Of all industries worldwide, pharma leads the PAC. We've been bought and paid for in Washington when it comes to our congressmen and our senators by the pharmaceutical industry. The pharma group itself, as well as individual pharmacy companies, all you need to go on the website and you can see how much money each company or each organization has given to each of the congressmen, each of the senators in your area and see who's the leading person in your congressional district with PAC money and money from pharma. It's all there. They've opened it all up, but it's still happening, I'm sorry to say. The Inflation Reduction Act kept insulin for Medicare receptions at 35, but that doesn't apply to private insurance. So that piece is there for Medicare right now, but it's not for private insurance. And I'm Medicare, but I, don't, I use my state health plan for my insulin and for my drugs, so it doesn't apply to me even though I'm on Medicare. So it only applies to Medicare Part D, and I'm not on Medicare Part D, I'm on A and B. Lilly announced it will cap out-of-pocket costs at 35 a month, including all insulin by Lilly as of next year. Novo said as of next year, they'll drop the price by 75% and changes will go in effect January of 2024. Sanofi announced back in March, it will cut the list price of insulin glargine by 78% effective January, 2024. Company will establish a $35 cap on out-of-pocket costs for Lancers, all patients with commercial insurance. They launched an unbranded Lancers Biologic, 50% versus price cap out-of-pocket 35 for all people without insurance and cut the list price for its short-acting insulin glulysine by 70%. So they are responding because of the pressure being brought by the American Diabetes Association, by patients, by Congress. So everybody's getting on the bandwagon to say these insulin prices are too high. And if you're on insulin with type 1 diabetes, you can't do without your insulin. So do we have to force you to pay these outrageous costs for copays? And if you don't have insurance, the costs are through the roof. Nobody can afford these guys if you don't have insurance. Questions on the insulins? Yes. Are you? Yeah, but it's not, it's not one that uh, uh, I see used very often. So that's good to know. I hadn't I hadn't seen that, but I'm not I'm not on Medicare, so I, I don't look at that very often. But for my patients, I've not I've not had that request to use that combination, but it makes sense and it's something we ought to be using. Here. Soliqua. Okay. So if you look at the, these are some other things from the ADA guidelines. Glycemic manager already talked about. Blood pressure's in there, cholesterol's in there, and uh, cardiovascular and kidney. We've talked about cardiovascular. I haven't talked about kidney yet. Haven't talked about lipids. Haven't talked about the uh, blood pressure. So we're gonna talk about some of the other pillars now from the recommendations from the ADA. This is trends on blood pressure. This is a study published in 2020 in JAMA, looking at the trend between 2000 and 2018. And if we look at blood pressure control, we can see we peaked about uh, 2014. And what's happened since 2014? 
percent control. It's going down. We're not continuing to go up. We're now going backwards. We're not doing as well controlling blood pressure today as we were in 2014, according to this data from JAMA. One of the things that our friends at the American Heart Association have tried to stress is we really need to pay more attention to blood pressure measurement. So let's take a quick break and we'll, 